For our first talk, Rodrigo, as I mentioned, is CEO, CEO of One Laptop Per Child. And One Laptop Per Child, which many of you know about, has been around for a few years, and its mission is to empower the world's poorest children through education. So today, Rodrigo will tell us the success story of how One Laptop has revolutionized education through nonprofit entrepreneurship and also unveil information about the new Android tablet and how we can do our part to help. Please welcome Rodrigo Arboleda. Well, thank you, Rachel, and ha ha thank you, everybody, for being here today. My name is Rodrigo Arboleda, and I'm the chairman and CEO of One Laptop Per Child Association, which is the operating side of the One Laptop Per Child Foundation that has been run by my dear classmate and all-time friend, Nicholas Negroponte, of which you probably know more about. And uh, I'm very happy to be here because Google was one of our original funders and, uh, and benefactors. So this is a continuation of an already existing story between our two groups. Let me be very rapid in trying to reach to the end of the, of the ideas that we have here so Joe then can uh, talk about the book and why the connection between us, the book, and you guys. So um, let me tell you about the genesis of this whole idea. was an original concept that we had not only to use uh, technology in education in third world countries, but also something that we, Nicholas and I have been working together for more than 31 years, which is how to bring peace through education as well. So uh, that, that was used by some of the very talented advertising agencies that have been working with us for, on a pro bono basis, as most of everybody that has been working with us in trying to convey the message that this is a mission and this is not a market for us. Children for us are a mission and not a market. Uh, how did I get involved with this? Well, I'm an architect as a profession and I went to school with Nicholas Negroponte at MIT in the 1960s, so we are both architects. And I went back into practice in the private world, but 30 years ago I, I met with him and we started the first large scale project of education at a distance when, when Nicholas and I went to my country of origin, Colombia, and developed what is considered to be the most important education at a distance project ever done in Latin America at that time. It's 32 years ago. And uh, the final push for action for me, which has prompted me to educate, to continue all my life in the, in the current realm dedicated to this project is that I have lost these three children of a very rare disease of a heart condition and my only concern right now is how to leave the children of the world a little bit of the legacy that I hoped uh, I could have left uh, for my three children. And, uh, and therefore it's a combination of a professional friendship with Nicholas, a dedication to study and, and education and, uh, and, and my personal family uh, life. How this whole thing started, believe it or not, this whole thing started for us when we started looking at this in my country of origin, Colombia. In 1948, there was a, a very major discovery or an invention called the transistor radio. Well, a priest in the, in the forgotten lands of the Altiplano of Bogota saw this little invention and immediately saw the connection between that little gadget and technology and immediately put into every peasant in the region, at the end, it were more than 4.5 million peasants, a transistor radio in the pocket of their shirts while they were still plowing the land with oxen and, and very primitive ways. And in order to do that, he created a radio station that it was emblematic for 40 years in Colombia called Radio Sutatensa, Radio Sutatensa, who transmitted constantly while the peasants and their wives uh, were at home and the peasants in the field, constant um, programs of how to improve the conditions of the soil, the conditions of the household, 
how to uh, boil water, how to do the most incredible primitive ways that for us were taken for granted, but for them were not existent. This priest educated four and a half million uh, peasants in that way. Alvin Toffler in his book, The Third Wave and the Future Shock, visited with him. It was very important uh, at that time how to use technology in education and improvement of social conditions. The pedagogical side is to, is to gentlemen. It's, it's Jean Piaget from Switzerland and uh, our own Seymour Papert, the uh, South African mathematician who went to MIT in 1967 after having worked with Jean Piaget for 15 years. And they saw that people that wrote code or programs developed something that for you might be taken for granted right now, a very special condition of the brain and that um, people who wrote code could have uh, a better understanding of, of critical thinking, of uh, solution-oriented mentality, of sharing, and of, uh, of reflection. Those four issues were very important. So Seymour, in 1967, arrives at MIT to start the Artificial Intelligence Lab, and he has the odyssey and the audacity of this, telling that uh, every child in the future should have a computer and be able to, uh, to write code. At that time, the computer was larger than this building, Everybody thought that this guy was crazy, but Nicholas saw him when Nicholas was already after graduating from architecture and, uh, and told him, listen, far from believing that you are crazy, what I think that you, you are doing is, is great because what I'm trying to do is create a graphical user interface for us, poor architects that were the last architects that still uh, working, were working with uh, a square T's and, and triangles and pencils. So they got together, and that became an association that lasted for almost 40 years, because uh, um, Seymour now is almost 90 years of age, and that's with Nicholas at the, one of the last meetings that they were together. And uh, so that prompted us to say, we need to do something in, to try to, do, to bring the new technologies into education in similar fashion as the transistor radio and a radio station were brought at the time in 1948. And it is not difficult to understand because if you, if you take into consideration that the transistor radio of the time is today a laptop and the radio station of that time today is the internet, then immediately you can see the similarities and the symbolisms that are present in this type of concept. So we didn't invent every, anything. We just tried to advance a concept that we knew had worked very well for four and a half million peasants and tried to scale it up to the, to the, to the rest of, of the developing nations. So, we needed to then de uh, decide that we needed to differentiate learning from education. Education is one thing, it's accumulation of a lot of knowledge, probably sometimes encyclopedic knowledge, but it's many times, or most of the times, still after 150 years of the Industrial Revolution, it still is a very active person, which is the teacher, and a very pers a passive person, which is the student, listening to what they are talking about. Learning is about taking into your own hands more the destiny and being the architect of your own destiny. And if you do that from the very beginning, we can really accomplish tremendous miracles. And in order to do that, writing code is, I shouldn't be talking about this to you guys, but writing code for the rest of the world is not understood yet as a basic element of, of learning. And also, um, programming and constructionism, what we then develop after the basic concept of writing code was how a child of five years of age could build his own knowledge base by building, by doing. And that's when Seymour came up with this already well-known application called the Logo language, which is a, lo a language that allows a child of five years of age to write code in linear programming, something that for us, the pre-generation, required first to have known algebra, then calculus, and then physics. No, nowadays, with that language, this could be done. This was written in 1980, and it has been the basic element of our pedagogical ideas. And that is embedded in now in three iterations, which is called a scratch, it's called e-toys, and turtle art, depending on the age and the complexity of the child that is using them. But it's at the cornerstone of our entire pedagogical um, element. Then we started in 1982 in three countries. We started in Colombia, as you saw before. 
uh, when Nicholas was working in, in, in France with the President Mitterrand and Jean-Jacques Servant River in creating what he was called at the time the Centre Mondial pour l'Informatique. He was a pioneer working, trying to get children to use computers. And then we went to Senegal in Africa, and then we went to Pakistan in, in Asia. And that has been the most important element of the, of the experience that we have had. Then in, in 2001, in Cambodia, Nicholas and his family, his son and his former wife, saw this little village that has been very much published, and you can see it in 60 Minutes also, because there was a big segment in 60 Minutes about this little village, in which there was no electricity, no telephone, no running water, nothing. And Nicholas took a, a, a big screen, a, a, a satellite dish, and he took a little uh, generators, and, and, and all these children started. And the first world that they learned how to say was Google. That was very important because they immediately started to investigate in Google. In Google and that was one of the ideas that Nicholas brought to Sergi and, and Larry. And that's how they became involved with us uh, five years later on. This is school nowadays is emblematic. There are five of them right now in Cambodia in very remote villages. And you should take a look at the, at the, at the website in, in 60 minutes. So that, that idea in, 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 uh, in Cambodia gave birth to our idea that if this worked in Cambodia, it should work worldwide. And the, and the blocking element was the lack of access of a child to computational capacity at prices that they could afford. At that time, a laptop was over $1,000. And we thought that we should reduce at least to one-tenth of the value of the laptop in order to be able to really go to the base of the pyramid. So that's how the famous or infamous name of the $100 laptop came to be. It was not that we had already designed the laptop. It was that that was the order of magnitude that we thought was needed in order to really be able to break the barrier between massive scaling of access to computational capacity and not being able to do so. And also because then in 2005, internet was becoming really more ubiquitous and it was not as we did 35 years ago, which was very rudimentary telephone lines that took forever to, to transmit uh, 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 words. Then, Nicholas presented this with uh, Kofi Annan at the United Nations at the ITU meeting in, in, in uh, Libya, and it became an instant success in terms of concept. The concept was so powerful, curiously enough, it was more powerful because of the little yellow crank than anything else, but that remained in the because we can charge the, the battery with a crank as the radios in South Africa do. But uh, it was such a thing that uh, everybody became enchanted and many presidents of countries started to talk to us and then we decided to launch it. So what, did, what, what have we done? We converted the crisis into opportunities because of the, of the problems that we face in those areas of the world. And this is the computer at that time as, as was it presented, but this is the computer of today that you know very well because you have seen it all over the place. When you see a photo like this, you understand that something transformational has happened to the mind of a child. When you see the amount of concentration, when you see the amount of devotion and the, and the amount of time that they play. Today, again, this is seven years ago, you might think that this is so obvious because of the iPads and the Nexus and the other tablets that we have in, in place. But at that time, it was unbelievable uh, for a person to understand how much this could be an attractive element of learning. We ended isolation as well. I mean, the, the, the child in a remote village could become connected and learn and experiment and enjoy and play and do. And this is in the, in the remote villages of, of Peru in the mountains where a child was teaching their grandparents how to read and write. So it became a, 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 a child-centric approach and the children became the agents of change. We have been educated that we are the ones who embed in the children the change. In this capacity, the, the empowerment of the child became so obvious that now we based the change in their, in their shoulders. This is with, in Bogota with the Shakira singer. Um, we have all of her schools are with our laptops. And this is in a remote shanty town. And in this little place in which there is no even place for the, for the clothes, there are two children and each child has a laptop. We have delivered already two and a half million laptops in 41 countries and 21 languages. And, 
and this is in Nepal, and this is in, in Peru, and, and every, every place we go, this is the environment that we see. This is a real movement and a revolution, and this is in India. This teacher, before the computer arrived, used to teach in very orthodox manner. The children were all sitting in a row. They could not raise their hands to talk. If they raised their hand at the wrong time, the teacher would come with a stick and hit them, and, uh, and the computer arrived, and pandemonium uh, arrived. And uh, the teacher, in the, the next days, was teaching in this fashion. And he told us, I have never been in my life more alive and more feeling and contributing to the children's education than when they come in the morning. And I go home every afternoon saying, I need to prepare for tomorrow, because tomorrow they're going to be asking me so many questions, and they're going to be so many involved that I better be sh uh, sharp in what I'm going to answer to them. This is near Bombay. This is something that has, this is about a week ago or two weeks ago. You guys have given a prize to a sugar labs kid of 14 years of age, Agustin, in Uruguay, where we have 700,000 kids with computers. Every child in Uruguay in primary school age, including autistic children, including Down syndrome children, including visually impaired children, and including physically impaired children, has one of our laptops connected to the internet. It is the first country in the world in, in which something like this is happening. It's the most important educational laboratory in the world, and you guys have something to do with it, and you should be very proud of what has happened there. Well, if this guy, which is a 14-year-old hacker, and, uh, and you guys are giving him a prize, and you're going to bring him over here to California, happened to him. Can you imagine? What could have happened to the other 700,000 children that are in, Africa, in, in Uruguay, or to the 900 children that are in Peru, or to the other 220,000 that we have in Rwanda in Africa with a computer connected to the internet? This is the challenge, and this is where the synergies between what you guys do and what we do could become important. Let me show you this one also, another Dime, case. This is in Peru. para todo, todo lo, lo que hay de comer. Pero él, él más se preocupa de tra por mí y de su trabajo. Esas son cosas que hacemos, pero más lo que me gusta es mi laptop. En Wikipedia hay cuentos, historias, matemáticas, ciencias, religión, he won a prize and Robert Redford brought him to Hola, Sundance. Mi nombre es Caín Abel Tapia Chávez y soy de Lima, Perú. Because of what soy he did with the life, the changing of the life of a child. Y vengo de Lima, Perú. The teacher el went, de went with him. A 10 personas para todo el Perú que hicieron la grabación. Me dijeron que tenía que gra ir a grabar a, a un día de la vida de, de Caín Abel. Lo que yo quería captar, y no sé si lo logré, hasta ahora no lo sé, es su alegría de vivir, pese a todas las dificultades que tiene, a las carencias que tiene, tiene una alegría de vivir y una vivacidad por transmitir eh, afecto, cariño. Yo, yo le diría a los niños del mundo que estudien en sus escuelas, que hagan sus tareas, y que no se le renegar a sus padres. El gobierno peruano ha repartido la, estas computadoras a, a la totalidad de escuelas rurales, una para cada niño, con el fin de acortar la brecha digital, porque ellos no tienen oportunidades. Mi laptop es, es como mi amigo, como mi hermano, porque cuando estoy solo en mi casa, prendo mi laptop, a veces estoy jugando, pero si no quiero jugar, Estoy escribiendo unos cuentos, ¿sí? y lo que más me gusta es, es la, la actividad pintar. Y también me gusta la actividad de Wikipedia, porque en Wikipedia puedes encontrar lo que sea, porque es una biblioteca gigante. Yo pienso que lo ha seleccionado por él, porque a ver, por, por sus ojos, mírenlo, los ojos transmiten mucho. A mí me gustaría ser actor. Me gustaría que me grabara. 
Life in a Day es una oportunidad que tenemos las personas que no estamos en el medio. Queremos que el mundo se entere cómo es nuestra realidad y cuáles son nuestras expectativas. Tenemos bastante ansiedad y curiosidad y queremos ver la película. Que... Imagino que sería lindo. También triste. Porque mi vida es triste. Porque esto... Porque mi mamá murió y yo estoy trabajando en vez de mi mamá. So, these two, these two examples, Agustín and this kid, uh, give you a, a living testimony of what this is all about. We have not a computer project. We are a social equality project and a change of paradigm of education project. That's exactly what we are. And this is uh, what had happened until now. I want to show you where we, where we are right now because this has to do also a lot with you. Until now, we have been working in Linux and the sugar environment, which is the user interface, is nowadays adopted worldwide and is un understood and accepted that it is becoming the standard of which education should be all about, a one-to-one. -one. But we are developing a tablet that is all Android-based, and even more, we are now porting our sugar environment into Android. And this is one of the reasons why we are here today is because the opportunities for synergies that could be developed among us. This is coming now in, the, in, a, in about two months, and uh, Walmart is going to be introducing For the first time, we are coming to the States. We have done it in two stages. We went to two slums in Miami, where I live, in Liberty City, because there are pockets of ignorance, violence, and, and, uh, and, and uh, ignorance in Miami or in any other city of the United States, equally bad as many countries that we find in the third world countries. And therefore, we should have charity start at home. So we, I was able to convince Nicholas that although this was originally intended for third world countries, there should be something that we can contribute here in the States. So what we are doing right now is launching a massive approach of how to bring to children of five years to 12 years, or now with tablets from three years to 12 years, an educational tablet that could be of, of, of use to them. And this is going to be called Build Your Own Dreams. And, um, and this is all Android. And it is all dedicated to inspire children and to use the, the constructionist approach to learning in the most important fashion that we can. And this is going to have all the books. I mean, and this is all designed by the same team that designed our, our laptop, which is Yves Behar a group here, Fuse Project in, in San Francisco. Uh, for which uh, even our laptop right now is in the permanent connection of the Museum of Modern Art here in San Francisco and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is the Excel tablet, and this is where we are now trying to combine the, the worlds of Linux, Android, portability, and, and, and low price, because this will come at a much lower price than, than, the, than the laptop. And then I wanted to give you a very brief glimpse before I, I, I give uh, Joe the opportunity to round up what we are here today is uh, our next long-term development. Uh, Nicholas has just been named chairman of a very interesting project, which is the XPRIZE project that you guys are involved with, uh, because of this particular project. I mean, it just happened uh, that we are interested in children that had, had no opportunity whatsoever to know how to read. I mean, when they are 30 kilometers away of the, of the nearest school and where are nobody in their communities or villages in which anybody knows how to read. And we think that there are between 60 million and 100 million of these children worldwide. So we went and looked around and we found in Ethiopia this community in the, in the crater of a volcano up in the mountains at 4,000 meters high up. And we distributed be, with, together with Sugata Mitra, which you already know as well, and together on, on the Hole in the Wall project in, in India, and together with this lady by the name of Marianne Wolf from Tufts University who dedicated her life to study autism. And through that, she started to understand when mankind learned how to read. When you pass from a very graphic description of the Egyptian jeroglyphics to the very abstract writing of the cuneiform writing code of the Assyrians. When that happened, 
she discovers and she explains in her book, the size of the brain increased in about a millennium or two from about 600 gra grams to 1,000 grams. So the brain had to create an enormous amount of, uh, of cells in order to be able to understand the passage from a figurative environment to an abstract environment. So together with these two gentlemen, uh, lady and gentlemen, we have launched this project. And this is, well, unfortunately, it's too dark for this one. These are the villages in, in Ethiopia. And we, about, about a, eight months ago, started the project in two villages with 23 computers. These are Motorola, uh, not computers, but uh, tablets. This is the environment. This is the type of village. There are no electricity, no sign. The only words that we were able to find were some of the clothes that the Adidas name or the whatever type of description that came in the clothing. Nobody in the, in the communities learned how to read or write. They had never seen a sign. And the only thing that we installed was a solar panel to charge the batteries that every night charge the computers and the, the tablets. And these are Motorola tablets. And the, we gave the boxes to the children in boxes. Uh, and, with, and 10 minutes later on, everybody has un, unboxed the, 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 the tablets. 15 minutes later on, they knew how to turn it on. Two, months, two, two days later on, they were already exploring. And, and, the, and, the, and the whole thing was so incredible that even a month and a half later on, we have, um, we have not put the video camera to, to use because we were afraid that they were going to start streaming video. And they hacked the, lab, the, the tablet and they put the camera to work. I mean, and nobody knew how to do it. And, and that's when the tipping point came to us. This is something, again, transformational. And this is something that we should look around. And that's when Nicholas, about a month ago, came and talked to Larry and, 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 and Sergi. And, and, uh, and in that group, together with other companies, they created the X Prize. And they are now putting $10 million to develop a project in the next two years of the most innovative way of teaching or learning how to read. Because if you, read, if you learn how to read, then you read how to learn. You, there's a tipping point about seven or eight years of age in which if you have learned how to read, then you can use that reading expert, expertise into reading how to learn. And that's where we are interested in. And that's the frontier in which we want to advance. And this is the type of environment that you can see uh, together, you know, they, they are working. This particular photograph is very important. Look at, look at, at what is happening here. This kid is looking at this other kid work. This kid is looking at this other one. Then you have one that is sort of the supervisor or the teacher. <laughs> and, and this is a complete environment self-created by them in terms of how a complete village can really take into their own hands something that until then was absolutely not existent. So a few weeks later on, if you could see, they were already doing the alphabet and they were already writing in the floor. They learned, they were already singing the uh, alphabet, A, B, C, E, F, D. And they are now really giving us the first glimpse that indeed a child could really learn how to read. And if we, if we prove that in the next couple of years, this will be as transformational as the entire element from the, from the Gutenberg uh, printing uh, stage. This could be a transformational element. Because until now, we have been told that you need a teacher to tell you how to read. So I'm finalizing here with, uh, with just why I'm here. Uh, I gave you the history. Well, number one, I met uh, Joe in Mexico. And we are trying to work a lot in Mexico and in Latin America. But evidently, the commercial entities like the Microsoft and all the other similar guys are not very happy because we use Linux and we want to have a free and we want to have open source and we, have, we are trying to advocate all of the things that, that are not very commercial for them. And uh, what, we can, what I can ask you for today is for you to leave with you and what Joe is going to tell you about is um, how can we again, re-engage. You were together with us seven years ago. It was transformational. Then we became perhaps too mundane for the Google stratospheric type of things. But now we have a proof of concept. Now we have shown that this can be done. And then we have seen a new frontier that comes up. And the new frontier is how on earth can we scale up? 
how we can really pass from the two and a half million laptops to the 200 million laptops, to the 100 million laptops, because otherwise an entire generation of children, ages five and more, will remain in the same obscurantism of the medieval area in which they were born and their families were born. How to create synergy, how can we work together with the group that encompasses the, the Google uh, family and the, and the Android developments and so forth. And for that, I'm very thankful that Joe, um, very generously in his, all of the royalties of his book are gonna be given as, as a contribution to LPC and that's one reason that I wanted to be here with him today because uh, that is the type of a spirit uh, and, and of a mission like this that is surpassing any commercial or any uh, element of mercantilism that we might think of as the other people do. And without any further ado, what I would like to suggest to you guys is uh, help us. Tell us, write to us, think about it, how we can really help hundreds of millions of children take advantage of technology into their education. There's my, my website, uh, my, my email uh, address, and, uh, and feel, feel free to, to suggest ideas. We need your help, because um, otherwise, we will just remain on a two million or 10 million, and that's not what we were created for. Without any further ado, I would like to ask Joe to give you a glimpse of what he's done, and thank you very much for your attending to me. Thank you.